the Lemurians from Mount Shasta at some point in the future will come out of portals, stone walls in the Sacramento River area. Edward Lancer wrote of seeing Mount Shasta ablaze with a strange reddish green light from the window of his Oregon bound train. This sounds like the elves from Lord of the Rings, dude. It does, doesn't it? It's like it's like in Lord of the Rings when the elves go to Middle Earth. We're leaving you all now. Goodbye. We're getting on our ship. Not just that, he's talking about a village and Lemurians or a city that he saw through his telescope. Like, okay. okay, so where did he see this city? A white race called the Wagas that sound and appear very similar to the elves kind of just sent me on this rabbit hole because there are other claims from other researchers saying that the elves lived in this part of the world, that it wasn't actually Europe, that it was over here. We found many interesting, exciting, bizarre, strange, and wonderful accounts of, of, of the Mount Shasta area, Lemurian culture, uh, ancient, call it whatever you want, Lemurian or not. First was, John, something you sent me, um, a book by Lucy Thompson, mm -hmm. uh, who was a native woman in the Shasta area, and it was written around 1856, right? Right. That was a, yeah, it's a very interesting book. Uh, she was uh, part of a tribe who she was actually a princess from what I believe in this particular tribe. And she wrote a book, learned how to read and write, married a, a white doctor and le learned how to read and write. So she wrote this book uh, to, to give her people um, oral history from the past in written word. And so this book was written in the early 1900s. I think it was published, I think, 1916. I think it was. Don't quote me on that. Um, now, she calls, she calls herself and her people Indians. So we're using the term Indians because that's what she called them. Okay. It, whatever yeah. it is, Native Americans, Native Indians. Anyway. So... She was saying, starting on page 64 of this particular book, she is talking about um, when they, they made their first appearance in this area, right? In, in the area of the Klamath River, um, that this area was actually already inhabited by a white race of people. And she called them the Wagas, W-A-G-A-S. And this, this tribe of people that they came across were, were, they were pretty cultured. They knew about the land. They, they knew um, how to get the proper plants, medicine, et cetera, et cetera. And so they taught uh, Lucy's people a lot of things about how to live there. Because previous to this, Lucy Thompson had said that they had come across the land bridge um, you know, we're talking about the Siberian, uh, land bridge to Alaska back, you know, gosh, I don't mm. know, you know, when it was frozen over when actually land was like there and they come down to this land, they find these people there. Um, now they say that these people are the original ancient people and, and the possessors, the first possessors of this soil right here in the Americas. Uh, and they never, ever had a problem with these people. They were very close and they were so close that there were intermarriages between the races. So, so some of, you know, she would say like even some of them started to have lighter skin because they, be, they were mixed breed with these, with these other beings that were living here. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, she said the, the Indians recognized the rights of these ancient people as the first possessors of the soil exactly. and no difficulties ever arose between the two people. Right. Right. Um, you know, and they, they in, well, you know, she said native Americans in 1856 still worship the hallowed places that these people once trod. And they said that their morals, she said that their morals were superior and inspired mm -hmm them to greatness. Well, they were a highly moral and civilized race, to, according to her. 
Right, right. So, so it's interesting because, you know, you have a lot of, of stories coming from native tribes across the Americas, even central, south, south of Central America, Mexico, that speak of um, when they saw the white people, they, you know, when you're talking about like um, the Spanish coming over and they saw the white people, they yeah. thought that it's, it's, th they're, they're back, they're back. So it was a, it was a glorious event for them because they were waiting for the return of these specific white people, not just um, this tribe, but the other tribes across the Americas, you know, that had interaction with the Wagas. Like, I believe that these people were, were more than just in that area. So at a certain point, she says that after we had lived with these ancient people so long, they suddenly called their hosts together and mysteriously disappeared for a distant land. And we know not where. We have no memory of their reason or cause and why they abandoned their ancient homes once they had dwelt for untold centuries. So this is an interesting thing, right? This, this sounds is, like this sounds like the elves from Lord of the Rings, dude. It does, doesn't it? It's like it's like in Lord of the Rings when the elves go to Middle Earth. We're leaving you all now. Goodbye. We're getting on our ship. Right? Yeah. This is a fascinating thing to me. Um, you know, and I think what you were showing me this really interesting map comparing <laughs> Okay, okay. <laughs> yeah. I got myself for all y'all at home. You were getting all amped up on Middle Earth. <laughs> I got, okay, so we're, we would probably need a proper episode to really cover <laughs> all of this, but I'm just going to kind of just give you a taste of this information, which is that I started to, when I saw this account from this Native American woman, I was very moved by it in a way where I was like, Oh my gosh, because right. this seemed to put together other information that I heard from other researchers like Al Fry and even <laughs> then beyond Jay Widener, who were talking about Lord of the Rings, that J.R.R. Tolkien basically claiming that, no, he didn't write this book, that he was recounting what he had read in the Oxford libraries. Not, not a story. This was like real history that he was trying to bring forth. Now, I don't know how much of it was his creativity and how much of it was an actual retelling of an ancient story. But this is the claim that's out there. Now, Al Fry, this researcher, really believed that it had to have been the West Coast of the United States that served as Middle Earth at the time. So I got curious and I was like, you know, I've never done this before. Let me lay the map of Middle Earth over Northern California and see what I find. And I was like, what the heck? Like the mountain ranges, aside from the, the Mordor mountain ranges, which were really bizarre, like the Sauron created like square. Right. Actually, Lindsay will probably pull this up for us. Um, you can just pull up a map of Middle Earth. Just pull up a map of Middle Earth. Do you search for it? And it's like a billion come up. Um, now, there's a very specific uh, type of shape that the mountains of Middle Earth make when you see them. Okay. You see on the left here, there is this line of mountains all the way on the left. Up, yep, right there. There's a line of mountains. And then on the right, there is this like swooping line of mountains that come down, right? And there's this little hook that kind of comes out here and stuff like that. And then, okay, now as you're going across, you see this like bizarre, like what mountain range is ever shaped like that? It's literally blocking mortar off from the rest of the world, right? So that isn't really realistic. But the mountain ranges in the on the on the northern coast here are are plausible. So I'm thinking to myself, well, hey, if I look at a map of California, I wonder what how the mountain range is going to appear. Um, and if you pull up, a, like you could actually do a search for Middle Earth map of California where they've done it in a similar style so that people can kind of see this a little bit better, where it's an accurate-ish map, but it's, you know, in the style that we're looking at here, this old antique sort of vintage map style. Now, if you look at those mountain ranges at the top, yeah, it's almost a, it's a very similar shape 
the the ones on the left only go down so far. The ones on the right come down much further. And Mordor would be like Las Vegas, which makes right. sense, actually. OK, I'm yeah. joking, but maybe not. I don't know. But I just thought that that is very strange. And now, like, as of course, the first thing I think is like, was Mount Shasta, Mount Doom? But of course, like Mount Doom was way over down there in, in Mordor or whatever. But and OK, here, obviously, you guys at home, this is a gigantic tangent and it's crazy talk. But the fact that a, a group of a white race called the Wagas that sound and appear very similar to the elves kind of just sent me on this rabbit hole because there are other claims from other researchers saying that the elves lived in this part of the world, that it wasn't actually Europe, that it was over here. So I was like, wow, maybe, maybe they came across some of this and I didn't know about it or something. It's just a very, very fascinating yeah, it's a weird, it's a weird, it's a weird correlation. Yeah, it's definitely weird. It, it, this, I mean, literally, you have a race of beings. This is according to Lucy Thompson. You know, you have a, a race of beings who are they're very kind. They're they'll they connect to the new ones that are coming to the land, and and they intermarried with these people, and they didn't leave because there were any wars between them. And they were as close as, as brothers and sisters to these Indians, right? And on leaving, they went towards the north. This is what she says. And then they left stone monuments on the tops of high mountains. And these landmarks were kept in repair by the Indians down through the ages in, in a remembrance of them. And Lucy even states that she repaired some of them herself. So these are probably still looked after to this day. And the, the Wagas told the Indians that they would return to them at some future time. This is in 1856, you know, but they hadn't, you know, they'd been gone, I think, thousands of years at that point, and they hadn't returned yet. Um, so this is a very interesting story that she relates here because, you know, you make that reference to, to Middle Earth, and it, it's literally like the, the, the elves getting on the boat and going away, but exactly. it is... Also, what I find really interesting about the story is the idea of the stone monuments and and the, the there they are a being that is transcending to some other dimension. Right. That's how I take it. Just like the Middle Earth elf thing. Right. They're yeah, transcending they they, to another dimension. They couldn't hang anymore. They didn't belong right. in this. And it was the it was the time for the humans, not the time for the elves like they were too advanced. Exactly. Exactly, exactly. So that's what I find so incredibly fascinating about the story and and how it potentially relates to the idea of the Lemurians, right? I mean, we'll get into that stuff, but I don't know. What else do you have to say about this? Because, <laughs> oh, man, my mind's pretty I'm, blown right now. Yeah, I know. I mean, okay, so just, just to, you know, talk about this other aspect that Lucy talks about. She said that when they first arrived on the continent, they connected with the Wagas. The Wagas told them that there was an ancient race of giant people who they were swarthy and they had items so large that no ordinary man could lift them. And then also large animals roamed the earth, birds and whatnot, large plants at this period of time. And that age was the age of the giants. And the giants, the Waga stated, were very cruel and wicked, and they used to eat the Wagas if they can catch them. Now, this is a story. Now, these stories, like when you when you hear these stories about the giants eating native peoples, other native tribes, there are stories like specifically coming out of Nevada. Um, there's one that comes to mind where the red haired giants would go after the native peoples there and eat them. And so the red haired giants, they smoked them out of that cave and killed them. And, and that later the cave, this cave was found uh, by some guano miners and they found giant bones in this cave. So it like verified this, this story of the native peoples had on killing these specific red haired giants. So you have these stories of giants eating, eating people. Now, Lucy says that they never ran across the giants, though. So at a certain point, she says that God became displeased with them and destroyed that race. 
Yeah, because they were so like nasty, immoral, and and, right. and and yeah, just murderous, really. Right, right. So interesting information in this book. Well, um, it, it goes on. Also, John, just I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off, but yeah, it, no, it goes on to say like it's so people are probably have questions about this, and she she actually she tells this story. She doesn't leave any details out. So basically, you're wondering at home probably. Well, hey. If there were objects that these giants had that were too heavy to move, well, where did they go? Because we should right. see them now. Well, it was described that, and this is what's so interesting to me about Native American oral traditions, is that she described how these huge objects had been covered by dirt and moved down over different cataclysms over a long period of time so that we did no longer come into contact with them. But their that their Indian tribes remember the times when they, when they could move around these objects and could not move them because they were too large. Right. That means these race, this race of giants was massive, massive. Right. And so, you know, we get to get to that stuff. You've got to wonder about that 60 foot hole that we, at Mount Shasta that we talked about in an earlier episode, you got to wonder, Hey, is that what they were digging for? Right. I mean, that was, you know, part of the questions that, that that friends were asking me, like, did they were they digging for ancient giant relics? Now, I will tell you this in my journeys and expeditions around the area of Mount Shasta, not on Mount Shasta itself, you will find like what appear to be ancient constructions. You will find big stone monuments that that spiral up hills. It's a lot like the California mystery walls, the East Bay mystery walls, right? You'll find that stuff all the way up there. But I came across this one area where there were these massive stone blocks. They were massive. They Wait, were where high. is this, John? Where? This would be north of Mount Shasta. Okay. Right? Massive stone blocks near this cave that were literally, they were cut, absolutely cut. They were something that a human could not move around. I'm telling you, no way, not, not even uh, a rudimentary crane can move these big stones. They were cut and they were moved into position next to each other. They were massive to create this walkway. And some of them had, had gotten like, you know, moved a bit here and there over time. Over time. But a lot of them were like perfectly aligned, perfectly aligned. And on, on top of that, there is this one area that there is this little mountain that has this astounding view of Mount Shasta. And there's a big granite rock that is cut into a chair, literally cut into a chair. And you could sit on it and watch the sky or you could watch the mountain. And I had some friends up in that area who had seen very strange, what they would call energetic type beings that would flow over some of these like stone rock monuments that looked slightly amorphous, um, gelatinous like and scaly. Look, man, this gets into the weird stuff because it's like it's like that weird mist stuff that people talk about with Mount Shasta. So and what like was the, this? What was this stuff? Well, I don't know. I mean, what what they described it to me as as was this sort of like semi amorphous being that didn't have like much form to it, yet had a scaly appearance on the outside and it would move above like in the air above some of these rock walls and rock lines. Now, when you get to some of the the, the remote viewing data on on these rock walls like especially when you get into california and what we saw was that they were they were pathways to channel telluric energy and electromagnetic earth energy and to be able to use it for certain means and so some of these rocks like if you stick a if you stick a um because um, they're piezoelectrically charged if you stick a um like a meter probe connected to a, a dc voltmeter in between the rocks, you will pick up a charge. There's charge flowing through these rocks. So I can I can see, I can understand that that there would be some things that would potentially paranormal flow off of them, right? Or use them, come to this realm from. 
maybe it used to be different in the past, more apparent, but you know, I think you can still see this stuff, find this stuff out there. Wow. Yeah. And that's, and that's Northern California. That's North of Mount Shasta. In between Mount Shasta and Oregon border. Yeah. Right. So there's a lot of, uh, it's, it, the, the land gets somewhat deserty, um, with sparse trees, um, not super forested. So you have wide views of everything. And so you, you have these rock walls up there. You, it's very why interesting. Is, why are, why are archeologists not talking about that? That seems so obvious that that's what that has to be. And, and, and you can walk there and find it yourself. So, well, the, 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 the reason why they don't talk about it is because, um, native peoples did not build these things, build these structures. Um, you, you could probably even find carvings, um, on some of these. I haven't gone deep enough. I found carvings in, in Northern California. Um, but I'm sure you'll find them up there too, which, which would turn more towards a smoking gun of something like really legitimate, but it would still be ignored because, native peoples didn't do that kind of stuff and there was no one before them. So, you know, we just need to ignore it. Yeah. It's natural formation somehow. Right. Right. Yeah. According to modern science. So, because it's, it's not even a, they won't even explore a possibility of there being something else before that. Right. Never mind something larger like giants that could potentially point to something in the ancient books being true. Right. You know, giants, right. whatever. Right. Right. So I think it's really, I, I like Lucy Thompson's story is legit. Like here you are talking about a person who is not a conspiracy theorist of the modern times. This is a woman, a native woman who wrote a book for her people on their oral history. And she's talking about some mystical white race and giants. That's legit. And beautifully retelling the story. Exactly. Yeah. Now, this is also interesting, doing a little bit of more research on this stuff. Lindsay and I found that the Wagas come from the land of Chikchikalth. What? That, what are you talking about? What's Chigalth? Chikchikalth is the name of the land that the Wagas originally came from. And this land, it's unclear whether or not this is in Europe or it's sort of like Valinor or something, as they call it in, in you know, Lord of the Rings. Uh, but you can see here, it would seem a distant land across the waters from the North American content that is located in the northern part of the world, which we call Chikchikalth. Man and woman in the valley of Chikchikalth knew no sin. Two pure souls were they in this valley of perpetual sunshine and flowers. It's like the Garden of Eden. Yeah, sounds like it. Wow. And so they they went. It's like Valinor, man. They just went back there. Yeah. Right. Yeah, that's that's really fascinating. Yeah. Cheek, so, but out. also, this is interesting. If it was like uh, you know another area of the world, maybe that we can get to that we can't. Maybe this civilization was across more of the planet than we're aware of. And who knows how much longer or how much further the Native Americans go back? Right. How, how long do these stories go? Like, I don't know how much. I don't know. Well, how I, think long you could, I think you could find reference to some ancient white race that a lot of these people interacted with way before white people claimed this land. Right. Way before. And that's why a lot of these races were looking forward to the return of the white person. Because they I weren't, think it was this race. Because they weren't jerks like the Europeans. Right. Exactly. Now, also, what's interesting is I, you know, I, I started thinking about this because we've done a lot of episodes and I never like to think that things are simple. But I do find it interesting that. This episode that we had where we were talking about Emperor Qin Shi Huang meeting with a group called the Wan Chu Citizens. Yeah. You know, when you translate something over from another language into Chinese, they'll just sound it out to whatever you're saying or whatever you're hearing. And we're not even sure right. if the Native Americans or the, or the Indians, whatever you'd like to call them, were doing that either. It's a little interesting that Emperor Qin Shi Huang's 
account of meeting with these Wanchu citizens that were, you know, very tall. They had exceptional types of um, of technology, and they could travel very far in a very short period of time. You know, they were called the Wanchu, and these are called Wagas, right? right. Also interesting is that Wagas, as is a, though it is a white race, there was also the is Nagas that were here in the past. And the Nagas were a serpent race that was half, I guess you could say half man, half serpent, right? And, but I don't, I think people will assume, oh, evil serpent, right? But I don't think it's that type of serpent. We're talking more about like, it's not. I mean, when we've no. looked at the Nagas, it's never been an evil type of serpent thing. Not, not at all. Yeah. No. And uh, so for reference, if you've ever watched this movie from the 80s that I loved called The Golden Child. Um, Is that with Eddie, Eddie Murphy? Murphy? Yeah. Eddie Murphy is trying to protect this child who's like this little Tibetan kid that's sort of like one of the llamas or something. And he's the, the chosen one, the golden child. Anyway, he has this meeting where he tears back a a screen and reveals one of these nagas in the background, and that like that movie blew my mind when I was a kid. I would like stare at the screen watching it because it was so interesting, you know. Oh man, it's Eddie Murphy movies. It's just, I don't know. <laughs> great movie. If you haven't seen it, great movie. Highly recommend. Ten stars. Twelve twelve star movie. That one. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So anyway, the Wagas obviously are our Native American ancestors and or friends. The Nagas are serpent beings. And the Wadshu citizens were the citizens that visited the ancient Chinese in the past. Because that was the whole idea surrounding potentially Nef Nephilim. No, Nephilim or Anunnaki. Yes, Anunnaki. Anunnaki or like right. this strange ancient sumerian time right. that we're just not aware of <laughs> right right well that's the whole quite, thing so, yeah like like that's the whole thing is that when when you're when you're talking twelve thousand ish years ago i mean you have like you have cultures that bled into um our current age that we're living in like the giants the giants existed here i mean even today there's gigantism which is part of that race and and they that, bled that's into, what you think it is you think that it's a mix yes. like some it's a genetic mix of some that race yes. kind of being weaved absolutely in. yeah really absolutely yeah and so so you have those ancient cultures that that fed into this um um timeline this time structure that we're in and and we still have the genetics of that stuff so but it's like these ages. It's like it's like what Edgar Casey said. It's like what we've seen with remote viewing data that that the Atlanteans were destroyed because of the negative state that they'd put themselves into. The giants, like you're you're hearing this from Lucy Thompson, the giants had destroyed themselves because of the negative place that they put, or God destroyed them because of the negative place they put themselves into. So it's like. This is the common theme, you know, and, and here you're talking about a Native American woman who is is referencing the same type of stuff that that um, psychics and other people have spoken about for a very long time. So. I find it the most legit, the most fascinating out of all of it, because she's a storyteller, she's oral tradition storyteller. And so the question then is. Did the Wagas really leave? They may not have from what I found. So, or they are much more quiet in what they do. Um, and it all comes down to a 1932 LA Times article about the strange lights appearing on Mount Shasta. And so we waited to talk about these lights that people have, have talked about uh, appearing on Mount Shasta because this article was so mind-blowing. Now, we're going to get into this here. Edward Lancer wrote of seeing Mount Shasta ablaze with a strange reddish-green light from the window of his Oregon-bound train. All right, He first thought it was a forest fire, but there was no smoke, 
and the light resembled the glow of Roman candles. Now, before we continue, I just want you to understand huh. that this strange lights appearing on Mount Shasta, setting the side of Mount Shasta ablaze. This, this is actually, a, I've seen the phenomena happen before on Mount Adams. Correct. Yeah. And Shasta has this, and it's been talked about by multiple different accounts leading up to today, even, even still through to today, people talk about this phenomena. The man, Edward Lancer, basically goes and he's trying to figure out what this is because it's strange. I mean, he's seeing it. It's, it's pitch dark. He's seeing it in the train and he wants to know what's going on. Right. So the train conductor says to him, he, he seeks out the train conductor, says to him, Lemurian, Lemur, Lemurians, basically. So the train, this is 1932. The train conductor says Lemurians. And he says, listen to this, they hold ceremonies up there. I just want to note here that the description uh, today on the LA Times website actually has it incorrect. And they uh, t- basically says that a, a fellow passenger told him this. But that's been re- repeated by other news outlets from this article uh, who didn't read the original 1932 article. And the original 1932 article that we're pulling up here says that it was a conductor. Okay, now Lancer was told that tall men from a sunken civilization were known to patronize local stores, buying enormous quantities of sulfur as well as a great deal of salt. They also buy lard and bulk quantities and bring their own containers of peculiar transparent bladders. Lard? Lard. Fat. Yeah. They're cooking. (laughs) They're cooking. They got to eat. They're, they're frying they're deep frying <laughs> oh yeah they're, they're doing they're doing whole pig fries up there or something <laughs> uh, they call them the lemurians for a reason maybe they're frying <laughs> lemurian lemurs okay so obviously bladders are are, are bottles in this case or or right. some type of container not an actual like bladder that you're commonly thinking of uh, in the human body All right. Now, uh, so these items were always paid for with gold nuggets when they were at these stores, and the gold far exceeded the value of the merchandise. It says in the article that businessmen, amateur explorers, officials, and ranchers in the country surrounding Shasta spoke freely of the Lemurian community and all attested to the weird rituals that are performed on the mountainside at sunset, midnight, and sunrise. Hmm. These are quotes, guys. I'm not saying this. Right. Okay. Now, of course, people ridiculed Lancer's desire to enter the sacred precincts, assuring him that an entrance was as difficult and forbidden as is an entrance into Tibet. So he was expressing the desire to go, right? Yeah. That's what he's doing. And he's telling the, the people of Mount Shasta that he wants to go. And they're saying, no, you can't do it. It's right. a secret place, but but they're actually verifying this secret place, right? Exactly. In yeah. a 1932 LA 1932. Times article, right? it's widely right. known and discussed, and it gets even more credible. Like, check this out. So, existence of the Lemurians was known to the Northern Californians for more than 50 years in 1932, so since before 1882, but only four or five explorers actually penetrated the invisible boundary of their settlement and no one succeeded in entering the village or at least no one's returned. Okay. Now this is where it gets crazy. In my opinion, the eminent scientist, professor Edgar Lucen Larkin, director of the Mount low observatory went into the area to explore, but then decided to view it with a powerful long distance telescope What he saw, he reported, quote, was a great temple in the heart of the mystic village, a marvelous work of carved marble and onyx, rivaling in beauty and architectural splendor the magnificence of of the temples of Yucatan. He saw a village housing from 600 to 1,000 people engaged in manufacturing, farming, etc. Eminent scientist John seeing yeah this. i'm 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 tripping out on this the, <laughs> no 
the Mount Low Observatory. So he was a he was the director of the Mount Low Observatory, and he's claiming he saw this on Mount Shasta through his telescope. It's science. <laughs> what? It's science. <laughs> he's a scientist. What? <laughs> Like this is what? this is some crazy stuff here. Like this is mind blowing. Now check this out. The Lemurians know of their apocalyptic past because each night at midnight throughout the entire year they perform a ritual of thanksgiving and adoration of Gautama, the Lemurian name for America. Uh, hmm. FYI, Siddhartha Gautama is the name yeah. of Buddha Sakyamuni, by the way. Exactly. So they're celebrating the escape of their forebears from the doomed Lemuria and their safe arrival in Gautama. That's very curious. Very curious. All right, now, listen. It's We're not even done yet. <laughs> the strange... Lights used in the ceremony illuminate all of the southern side of Mount Shasta in a baffling way that reaches up and covers the landscape. Lancer said that their light far exceeded their modern electrical achievements. The Lemurians can hide themselves if you spot them for a moment in the woods because they possess the uncanny secret knowledge of the Tibetan masters and, if they desire, can blend themselves into their surroundings and vanish. Didn't you tell me that you viewed people seeing people in robes in the woods and that they'd vanish upon looking again? I thought you told me that you had seen that when people have experiences where they're seeing these robed people. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's that that is part of it. Yeah. They they are they can be there one moment gone the next. So that's it's, actually something that you guys have seen. Yes. 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 And it's being corroborated in this story. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. That's just it's getting weird. It's just getting <laughs> weird. Like, I think it's got, I think it's already I, gotten weird. I'm literally just trying to digest what you're reading to me <laughs> because because oh man. It's a 1932 LA Times article, dude. Like people Okay, so this guy was the director. See, I'm still stuck on this guy being the director of the Lowell Observatory. And 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 seriously, like this guy is talking about this stuff. It's quoted in the L.A. Times article. And OK, so Why? I mean, like, you know, there was yellow journalism and stuff, but that's a little bit late for yellow journalism. And it's L.A. Times as well. So they wouldn't be just like played. They wouldn't be like like putting words in the mouth of a scientist, a, not, uh, an a, an eminent eminent scientist. not an eminent not an eminent scientist, not an eminent scientist, director of the low observatory. He's no, talking about things that. that we've seen in remote viewing data. Not just that he's talking about a village and Lemurians or a city that he saw through his telescope. Like, okay. okay. So where did he see this city? No, no, no. So hold that, hold it back up a little <laughs> bit. All right. So it's not that he saw Lemuria. What he saw was a place in which there were about, what did he say, 600 to 1,000 people at a site where they were holding ceremony. And okay, the ceremony would occur every, every night because in the village, in this what he called a village, because they were giving thanks to their uh, arrival in Gautama, our America, from the fallen uh, ancient civilization of Lemuria. Right. So he's basically he's he's basically heard he basically heard the story of the librarians doing ceremony. He grabs his telescope. No. Oh, no, no, no. The professor saw the lights. The professor became, saw the lights and he hears the story curious. that they're doing a ceremony, right? Yeah. No, I don't even think he heard the story, dude. He didn't hear the he story. Just trains the he telescope. Saw the lights, and he was like, "You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to put my telescope up there and see if I can find the epicenter of this thing and tell people what I find because not many Listen, people have a huge because... telescope right now." Yeah, I, I'm. I'm like <laughs> tripping right. out. Now, what's what? Okay, the most bizarre part of but what the, the guy in the train though he was the one that originally heard the story of them doing ceremony. <laughs> yeah. Yes. So, so basically, the scientist is corroborating the earlier story of the ceremonies, which was what makes this so bizarre. 
is that it would be weird if this guy, whatever his name is, is it Lancer or something? Yeah. It would be weird if Lancer, if it was just about him and everything Lancer is saying. But what happened here is they're talking about all of the accounts of Northern California's knowing that this is Lemuria and that there is a professor that basically put a telescope on the mountain and saw what he saw. This is nuts. This is crazy. It's, this is very interesting. Okay. Wow. Yeah. Okay. I'm now have to actually look at some of this stuff with regard to the professor because I need to figure this out a little it's bit. It's a deeper. remote viewing treasure trove, my friend. Right. It yeah. is. Yeah. I'm glad you found that art. I had actually heard little aspects of it here and there, but I didn't, I never heard the. Where do they come from, though? Right. right. Okay, so now li listen, this this we're not done yet. Okay. So <laughs> at times they came into the neighboring towns, tall, barefoot, noble-looking men with close-cropped hair dressed in spotless white robes that resemble in style the enveloping garment worn by high castle East Indian women, high excuse me, high caste East Indian women today to patronize certain stores. Once a white-robed patriarch from the Mystic Village went to San Francisco on an official visit with an escort of younger men to bring greetings and an assurance of goodwill upon the anniversary of the founding of their sacred retreat in California. He was met by an official committee at the Ferry Building and escorted to City Hall. After exchanging greetings, they returned to their retreat. Basically, these were Kasaya wearing people showing up and right. these people have only ever seen Indian women wear them. So they assume. Right. Like, you know, Kasaya's guys, for every, those of you at home, these are this type of garb that in Indian folks wear in, in right. their traditions. Okay, so now we have the <laughs> some type of uh, relationship that our government has, a known relationship with some of the citizens of this group that live peacefully on this mountain of this white race, the Wagas, maybe. Wow. Wow is right. I'm telling you, man, when Lindsay, when Lin Lindsay found this, when yeah. she found this and we were looking at this, we, our minds were completely blown. Right. You know, I was just like listening to a story. I don't, I mean, I've been researching this as well. So I was just listening to the story of this woman talking about how the beings in the mountain, she didn't call them Lemurians. She said other people call them Lemurians. I found yeah. her interesting. Um, she just called them the people in the mountain. And and she doesn't know what they are, she says. Um, but she's had experiences. And, and she said that they had a relationship with the military but the relationship got too controlling or tried to be controlling on the side of the military. So they further hid their entrances and have segregated themselves from that aspect of earth. Now that's this, interesting. This I don't know. I mean, who knows weird. if she read the article, I have no idea, <laughs> but here's the thing. All of this talk like about Lemuria I mean, and, and I, I like what she said as far as like people in the mountain, beings in the mountain or people in the mountain, because that's been my experience. So with Mount Shasta, you've got all that stuff around the edges, but then you have this crazy phenomena on the mountain, like this guy from Lowell Observatory is, 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 is investigating and coming up with the craziest story. Now, I've had experiences where I have been, it's not remote viewing, right? Okay. So we're, we're, we're stepping out of like the semi-scientific world of remote viewing. I don't know. And into personal experience where I've had personal experience of beings in that mountain that are on a different plane of existence, right? That, that literally can communicate telepathically. Like, and that would be something that I would stay away from in general, but I have put my mind into it sometimes and I see them. 
completely and they respond like they are of a different vibrational realm, like higher vibrational realm. So it's a hard thing to figure out with remote viewing itself because there's not really a ton to task on except now for this article that you have brought up. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Which, which I'm going to go after and figure out because because in my experience, I do believe that there, like with any volcano, like you're talking about a ton of energy. You're talking about the veil being thin, very thin. You're talking about um, zones that are hubs to other realms. That's, that's, that's how I've experienced volcanoes. That's what we see with remote viewing data. And Mount Shasta is one of them. Absolutely one of them. So, wow. Crazy article. Crazy article. And we're not done. <laughs> what? <laughs> There's still more, John. You're All right. Kidding. So, no. This is in the article, mind you. I'm not th I'm not making this crap up. Like this is actually in the LA Times 1932 article. Yeah, it's here. All right. Now, modern society's materials and novelties didn't attract these simple people at all. The Lemurians Quote, have frequently donated their large gold nuggets to charity. During the World War, they came forward with generous gifts to the American Red Cross. And what? more recently, they sent <laughs> how a did, bag. How, of... how does anybody know this? Wait, wait, wait. It's... All right. I have no idea. Like, how, how did, did they... anybody know this? How did the reporter track this down? I really I know. <laughs> I don't know. But it's really interesting. Okay, so. During the World War, they came forward with generous gifts to the American Red Cross, and more recently, they sent a bag of gold to the fund for sufferers of the Japanese earthquake. And so if they're visiting the town, probably just handed it to the people at town hall, or they have this relationship with the military that that woman claimed, right? right. Now listen to right. this. It's just exactly what you were just saying, again, is being brought up in this article. They have psychic and extrasensory powers. When a formidable fire crept up Mount Shasta, threatening the mystic village, they caused a wall of invisible protection to rise between the village and the forest fires. As the flames reached a certain point, they were mysteriously snuffed out. Lanzer said, you could see the very fine, the very definite line where the fire ceased to this day at that time. Of course, that would have been too long ago for us to see any evidence of that at this point. But well, that's then, the whole see... like uh, wall of uh, mist, right? Maybe, maybe. but I well, mean... maybe, maybe not, because like I, I, I think supernormal powers, right? Can, maybe, maybe not. Right. I'm kind of still like stuck on how the how they knew that they don donated to the Red Cross and all that. That's just. Well, okay, I mean, if they're going to San Francisco to meet with <laughs> officials, they've got some type of connection. And in good faith, maybe they're trying to just say, hey, you stay right. out of my our business. We see you're suffering. So and and if these are the Wagas and they're exceedingly kind, but they know humans are dangerous. Right. It makes right. sense for them to to politic a little bit. And I, I hate to call it that, but to, you know, give these olive branches of goodwill right. to your human beings. Right. I mean, I don't have a contention with anything being in Mount Shasta because, because I felt sure. it and I felt them looking at me. I sure. felt it and I felt their vibration. I have, I mean, that's getting very woo woo. It's getting very woo woo. But what I have contention with is calling them Lemurians. Oh, me too. I mean, and sure. everybody's, you know, saying, you know, I'm a, princess of lemuria and i'm here whatever to help you oh, whatever God. i mean i just don't it's not it's not valid it's not valid and and people misinterpret things um so i don't know man that was I'm, crazy that was crazy i article. mean i'm much more likely to call them the wagas than i am the lemurians at this right. point but the point being though is that there's something physical here that's going on call them whatever you want they're probably right. not going to care what you call them as long as they're like can keep conducting their rituals and they can do the things that they do right now you know i think it was edgar casey or someone who said that Oh, actually, you know what? I don't know where this came from, but I've been doing so much research that it's all just like a big. Right. <laughs> it's all in there right now. So a couple of things that I noticed was that th this story between Atlantis and Lemuria 
becomes very involved at some point. And, and a lot of it does seem like nonsense. But some of the lore around it is that the Atlanteans had become corrupt. Plato's account of Atlantis's fall, that, that was something that we looked at. And, but basically, the Atlanteans had became very advanced. Uh, they, they, too mu- there was too much debauchery. They became too um, just terrible people. And so they ended up being wiped out by this flood or by whatever it was that that was coming down the pipes. And right. their penance for what they had done to the earth was to delve into it. And so they wow. they they had to they had to their their sins for their sins they had to right. bury into the into the earth and and to not come out. And so the the remaining race of the of the Atlanteans is down there. The Lemurians right. were reportedly more spiritual and they did not have to delve down, but but instead ascend, which right. is interesting when we're talking about the Wagas and what Lucy Thompson right. is saying about them. Right, right. If yeah. the Lemurians, whatever, call them whatever, right? Well, okay, so, you know, when you get to some of the stories surrounding um, the Wagas and how they potentially relate, like you have uh, some people who believe that the Lemurians from Mount Shasta at some point in the future will come out of portals, stone walls in the Sacramento River area, right? And and then you have the Wagas who built stone monuments for the for the native peoples to upkeep. And, and you know, my it, Lucy didn't say this, but my whole sense was that the beings will come back when they're going to come. They're going to come through the stone. I mean, and then you have what I found in McLeod to be a false door portal, right? And you have other areas and locations that we've remote viewed that I won't disclose where um, of things that are on the sides of rivers that are shaped like some are shaped like pyramids that we've remote viewed and they are, they're portals where beings come in and out of. So there's like this huge connection with the Wagas into the Lemurians, into the lore around the Lemurians and these stone portals, in a sense. So, yeah, there's something big there with that. And, something big. And then you have the giants from the J.C. Brown story who fled underground to escape a cataclysm. But he thought that there were maybe they are Lemurians. Maybe they're not. I don't think they are. We have data that suggests they're not. Who knows? Or, or Wagas or whatever. Who knows what we're building on top of right now? Right. Like all of our stuff, all of our homes built over all of this dirt. And who knows right. what's under there? Who knows we're not even giving there. it a shot, you know? Right. Right. And and we have all of the intersection of these of these stories. Like all these stories are intersecting. And I'm sure that there are more stories that are oh, intersecting yeah. as well. Yeah, we haven't even gotten to the lizard people yet. Whatever right? you want to call the yeah, <laughs> whatever you want to call it, whatever you want to call these people, this race, whatever, it doesn't matter because there is something happening here. Something's happening, according to this 1932 LA Times article that I am sure you are going to be remote viewing. There is a lot yeah. happening. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and, and I'm telling you, man, at this point, because I was really, after researching the Helena Blavatsky stuff and this Frederick Spencer Oliver and theosophy and all the stuff that it was doing, I was just so like, wow, this is just a bunch of nonsense. And then I right. find this, and I'm like, what is going on? Right, right. Yeah. Wow. You know, what's interesting, too, is that the light, the light that's being described in that article, it, it matches the description of the light that happens on Mount, Mount Adams too, because sometimes like I've a seen that light. side of the mountain will light up, like it will just light up and you're going, what is that? Or the base of the mountain will light up, right? And so it, you get the same similar phenomena occurring. And we and, do know that there are beings that are associated with that mountain in an energetic way. Could there be actual physical beings living in that mountain too? I mean, when you think about lava tubes, lava tubes were a place to escape to, right? I mean, like lava tubes, 
it, 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 it makes perfect sense that the beings trying to escape would inhabit these and lead into deeper inner earth type constructs. Well, and, and are the mountains connected? I mean, and are the mountains about, connected? it's the, it's the same mountain range. It's the cascade mountains. Are they connected and are the similar, I mean, and it was even said that the Wagas traveled up North. Right. I mean, you just talk about North. I mean, that's, that's right. why I mean that's Mount could it be Mount Adam? We don't know where, right? Right. Right. Uh, where and um I also think that you know people's understanding of uh of what's physical and what's not needs to change because when we're talking about physical beings and other dimensions, I mean imagine that like there's like these religious nuts who say things like, oh, the true living Buddha or the, the true living Christ or, or all of this. Like, can you imagine Jesus being up in heaven or, or Buddha being up there and looking down and somebody saying that and, and being like, I'm more real than you. What are you talking about? <laughs> like, like we're like, oh, they're not physical because they're not here. Like our basis is here, but it's like right. that light could be more real than the light that we have here because the quality yeah. of the light is, a, is a more dense microscopic, powerful light that's coming through into this dimension. It's so right. strong. Right. 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 So it's right. like, it has to be like if there are if there are beings involved that are more capable than we are in terms of abilities and stuff these are real physical beings like they may be more capable they may disappear at a moment's notice if if they're not comfortable being around you but those are that's physical yeah right that's my assertion here anyway yeah no i'm with you on that yeah yeah what i would recommend here is between this week and next week, John, potentially we get you remote viewing this article a little bit. And then we end with what did you guys, what did you find? Yeah, about that sounds like a good 19, plan. 1932 LA times article, the scientists, all of that stuff. And what's really going on with St. Germain in the area of Mount Shasta, because that rabbit hole might be the deepest one, if you can believe that. And you might be shocked. Shocked. Because, <laughs> wow, what the heck? Yeah, right. And that's it's an entirely separate story outside of everything we were just going over that just yeah. adds in this element of bizarre mystery that we just love here on the Metaphysical Podcast. And we've got another article from the LA Times. They're on a roll. All right. Well, John, thanks for being here. Uh, this has been great. And uh, everybody at home, I hope you thought this episode was as out of this world as we did. Mm -hmm.